I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, to this talk. Uh, my name is David Knight. I'm the vice chair of the IABC British Group, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Lyons from Web Yates, who will be giving our webinar this lunchtime. Before we start, just a few uh, housekeeping notes and a few bits of information about IABC. Um, firstly, the, the webinar will be recorded. It's being broadcast live on, on YouTube uh, and in various places, so it will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, secondly, questions are, are welcome. Um, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A box on, um, on Zoom. Uh, and we will we will have a look at those at the end of the uh, end of the talk and hopefully address a few issues or comments that you might have. IABC is the International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineers, um, headquartered in in Switzerland, um, but with uh, national groups all over the world. Uh, in the UK, um, we run a whole series of events, including uh, talks, awards, um, conferences. Uh, and uh, site visits and, and study tours. Um, there is a lot more information about what we do on our website, iabc.org.uk, uh, and on the uh, IABC HQ website. Um, but particularly, I'm going to talk about the Nethercott Prize, um, which was a prize named, um, or is a prize named, uh, for former um, president of IABC, David Nethercott. Um, it's a prize for early career artists, architects, and designers uh, and engineers um, who write a paper and submit a paper uh, to the British group um, on a project that they've been involved with, um, but not necessarily directly responsible for. Um, and the idea of the paper competition is to encourage storytelling uh, and communication uh, in the written word about the work that we do and, and requiring participants really to be to think critically about their involvement in projects uh, and how they communicate that um, more widely. Um, Alex uh, was one of two shortlisted um, uh, speakers in um, uh, in last year's prize uh, and, and was awarded the prize at our Mill Medal lecture back in November. Uh, and this is his opportunity to tell us about the work uh, that he's done um, and uh, to um, really celebrate um, uh, the extraordinary project that he's speaking about. Before we get on to, to Alex, um, a few upcoming events to be aware of. Uh, the um, IABC British Group Annual Lecture uh, will be in May. Um, uh, the speaker is, is yet to be announced, um, but it will be followed by our annual dinner and full dates are on our website. Um, the IABC awards are currently open for submission uh, and the deadline is on the 31st of March. Um, do consider putting projects in, into that uh, for consideration for the IABC awards. And finally, the British group are um, organising the IABC Manchester conference in spring 2024. Um, information uh, will be released over time, but uh, just to save the dates for now, um, uh, the, the link is going in the chat. Um, it will be a three day conference in Manchester aimed to uh, talk about what construction should do uh, now the world is in a state of emergency. So um, it should be a fascinating uh, conference. Uh, please do consider attending and please do considering, consider um, submitting your uh, papers uh, for, for consideration when abstract submissions open shortly. So without any more comments from me, I'm going to hand over to Alex, who will take us through uh, the Dubai Expo shade structures. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share my slides. Hopefully you can see that, all right. Uh, so yeah, I'm, as David said, talking to you about the artwork of the Dubai Expo project. Um, which is now quite a few years ago that we did the work on it, but um, was only really completed in sort of 21 and 22. Uh, so it's still quite um, recent-ish. Um, just before that, my name... Okay. Um, my name is Alex Lines. I work for Web8 Engineers. We do a kind of whole range of projects and disciplines. Uh, we work on all kinds of scales or kind of projects. Uh, this one was a particularly technical one, which is why we were very interested in it. Um, but, and you can kind of see a cross-section of our projects there. 
Um, but I'm here to talk to you about the Expo 2020 Dubai, um, actually held in 21 to 22 in the end um, because of the pandemic. And this is a kind of overview, I think it's a render of the master plan that was done by Hopkins Architects. We were working with them on just the shading structures that you can see really, really small lining some of the districts there uh, in this plan. Um, our kind of brief for this project was really these renders. This was kind of the, the initial renders from Hopkins that was laid down as their kind of idea here. And really it's relatively simple. Dubai is a very hot place and you needed shading to actually go outside during much of the day. Uh, so they proposed to line the main spine, sort of main streets of the districts with shading structures um, of kind of different patterns and forms. But as a sort of engineer looking at these slides, especially, slightly terrifying because there's not a lot of structure holding them up and they're kind of floating, which is not always a good thing for us. Um, so our kind of project brief was to provide shade between the buildings. This is actually a KPI as well from the client saying there needs to be a certain amount of shade in between to make it actually tall enough to be usable as street space. Um, from the structural side and also kind of from a cost and environmental side, we wanted to make a lightweight and efficient structure which in this case really meant reducing the wind loads. Uh, we wanted to express the districts to help with wayfinding. So from those first couple of images, you can see that there was different shapes in different districts and they were lit in slightly different ways. Um, and then we also wanted really to get some repetition of form for both buildability and designability. We kind of realized from the start that we were never gonna be able to hit the program if every single shade structure was different and we had to design uh, 50 different situations. Um, there was various lights and um, speakers and other sort of um, electrical equipment mounted to them, uh, and they needed to be durable. So the, the expo site, it, while the expo was a temporary sort of uh, six to nine month show, the entire site was intended to have a full sort of like design life. So these shade structures, it wasn't quite building design life, but we still had to be aiming for 25 years. So they weren't by any means a temporary structure. Uh, and of course, beautiful and elegant. These were kind of lining the main streets. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that they were kind of a showcase of interesting design, made the space nice to walk around. So we kind of set to work. Um, first thing we decided was that it needed some sort of cable net. So this is us playing around with different shapes and options for cable nets and discussing them with the architects. There's kind of infinite different cable nets you can create, but we were trying to sort of zone it down into a couple of different forms that were possible. Um, this is a kind of typical district. So there's three districts of the expo site. There's the opportunity district, the sustainability district, and the mobility district. So this is one you can kind of see um, indicatively on here how the sun shades are kind of strewn along the kind of central spine of the uh, district we were proposing that each of them would be the same and then there'd be kind of webbing structures in between to connect them all up. Um, one of our main things was reducing wind load. And so we played around with quite a few ideas of making the panels pivotable. So this would allow the wind to go through the structure when it was windy, but also just provide shade when it wasn't windy or just generally. Um, this is kind of coming up with ways that we can make sure that those panels are hung easily and uh, can pivot freely, but also are kind of set at the right angle, like the renders at the start. So this is kind of a slightly complicated um, weighting mechanism. But in the end, we kind of zoned in on more folded plates that were hooked onto the cables like this. Um, so this is all three different districts of different shapes. We actually ended up just using the one on the left and then expressing it all with um, perforations to get sort of different districts looking in different ways. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was kind of our concept stage of just throwing all the ideas out and trying to figure out what the best way of um, actually addressing the brief was. And what we kind of ended up with was uh, 53 shade structures, all of the same base geometry and cable net. Uh, actually, we ended up with four different types once we started going through the individual cases, but it was a good goal to have. Um, a central mast then with a tensegrity cable net hung from it. Uh, so this allowed us to kind of mean we had reduced structure, but we didn't have no structure like in some of the renders at the start. 
uh, and then webbing net cable nets to infill between the structures. So we have a standardized structure and a couple of different types. We originally had four types of webbing, A, B, C, and D, and ended up with about 11 once we started going through with all the slightly different situations. But again, it's good to start simple and then have to add complexity afterwards. Um, and then folded aluminium panels hung on the cable net and allowed to pivot and the perforation patterns different for each district to get that wayfinding and kind of different look from each place. Um, the, one of the key things that we highlighted was that the hanging panels on a cable is sort of simple in conception, but would need some sort of clamp to keep it in place, some sort of washer to stop it damaging the panel and rotating freely. And that bit would have to last a 25 year design life or at least have some sort of maintenance schedule. So we kind of highlighted that, that was going to be a custom uh, component. And I think there was about, would need about, about 10,000 uh, panels. So quite a high number of them as well. Uh, and one of the other things that we were keen to try and do was simplify the tensioning process of the cable net. Because uh, as you kind of might know, if we've got a complicated table the cable net structure, you can spend days going around trying to get it to the right tension state. So because we had individual shading structures, we we're hoping to be able to just tension from the top or bottom to pull the entire net into the correct um, force distribution, keep it stiff. So that was the kind of concept. We then dived into the theory behind all these things that we uh, had decided to do. So th this meant quite a lot of parametric design. So we're using Grasshopper and Rhino to generate the shapes uh, and doing a kind of basic form finding within that. Um, so this ended up being our kind of parametric workflow. We'd use uh, Grasshopper and Rhino to generate the geometry. We then export the coordinates of that so that we could then analyze it in uh, Oasis GSA and also start building a Revit model. So this was kind of linking those things together to make sure that we were analyzing and modeling the same thing. Um, that was a kind of cyclic thing as well of um, checking that the GSA model was getting to the right stiffnesses and then adjusting the cable nets as we needed to within Grasshopper and then re rerunning through it. Uh, the panel geometry was also generated in the Grasshopper script. And one of the key things was making sure that all those panels balanced correctly at the right angle. So because we were doing it parametrically, we could um, balance all of the panels at the same time. Uh, and it would just say, this is where the panel needs to be in order to balance and hang at the right angle. Um, we did some quite complicated adaptive components in Revit to try and model everything a bit more straightforwardly. Uh, and then we put that all together using various dynamo scripts to position all of our um, sunshades and webbing and panels all together in one go before we started then generating the uh, drawings. So it ended up being quite, quite a sort of complicated workflow, but it kind of evolved as we were going along and definitely was worthwhile doing it with parametrics because it meant that we could adjust the cable net of one of the 53 shade stretches and then run through this process and adjust all of them in the robot model. Uh, so then this we also played around with what, they, what it might look like. So this is uh, a render. Um, moving all the panels as if it was uh, wind blowing around it, just to kind of get a view for the architect of what this might end up like. So all of this is um, parametrically generated, all of the panels, and then moved into positions to run the movie, the GIF. Uh, and then we also used those same initial models to double check that the shading we were creating was the right sort of percentages as well. So we kind of gave, gave these models to the architects. They ran quite a few complicated um, sun path analysis things through them just to check that the shade were getting the right sort of amount. I think after the first round of this, they realized that actually it wasn't the right amount. And so we had to adjust the size of all the panels, which again was lucky that we parametrically made them because then we had to re regenerate the entire lot in about the two week period, which would have been painful if it was manual. Um, we did quite a lot of theoretical analysis of what the loads onto the actual panels were as well. Um, the Eurocodes obviously covers buildings quite nicely, it covers masks quite nicely, it covers flat plates quite nicely, it doesn't really cover all those things together. And then when you throw in the fact that all the panels are flat plates and can move, uh, you're very far outside of the standard codes. So this was really going to sort of first principles of really mechanics and aeronautics about 
what is what are what's the lift and what's the drag we're going to see on these panels how much do we think they're going to move um, checking their inertia and checking their balance position so you can see on the top left there kind of diagram of how we were playing with the balance position of the um, panels in order to get them angled correctly um, the folding as well was a really good um, simplification of fabrication of these panels so that they could all be um, water cut and then just folded twice and you had a panel there wasn't really much post post fabrication that needed to be done to them so that was quite um, quite a clever little fix that we didn't really have to bolt anything together for these panels and then we hooked them onto the cables uh, so following kind of all this theoretical analysis, we we ended up at about, we thought, 60% sort of solidity of our shade structure. Um, we knew the wind would push the panel almost flat if it was a steady state continuous wind, but obviously wind doesn't work like that. So in reality, a gust would push the panel out of the path of the wind. It would then swing back again and actually end up even more in the path of the wind and then swing back and forth again. So we did a couple of kind of spectrum analysis to try and work out how much wind load that thought we meant we actually picked up because in the steady state model you'd end up with almost no actual wind load being picked up by it whereas in reality due to the gusting of the wind you'd end up with quite a lot um, the frequency the panels swung at was also calculated for every panel um, and then we compare that and the frequency of the overall shade structure or mast is the main thing uh, just to make sure that our, we were factoring in dynamic amplification and effects of the fact that everything was moving a little bit is not normally your uh, building requirement. Um, the big unknown really though was how much wind the panels really would pick up. Um, the, what the damping was of them was also important and how much they would move, their inertia, their friction and how long the fuss were were all a little bit hard to start, uh, define, especially once you started trying to stretch it to kind of a 25 year design life. So we made some reasonable estimates, but we knew we were going to have to do some other testing to really verify those numbers. Um, we did quite a lot of GSA modeling as well at this point, just to really verify the forces within the cable net. Uh, make sure that we could tension it the way we wanted to and making sure that we weren't buckling different things. So the the, the uh, bottom image there that's kind of going through the buckling modes of the base of the sunshades, which is a flat plate structure. So this was double checking that we didn't end up buckling that plate when we tensioned the cable net too much. Um, this is kind of some images then from at the sort of end of the um, workflow with Dynamo and Grasshopper. So the bottom left is an adaptive component of the panel. So the idea was we made one adaptive component, one panel, and then we used the Dynamo script to apply that to all of our shading structures. You can kind of see the, the wire nets and the various different forms that we had there on the top. So once we'd done all the theoretical uh, part of this, our next stage was to actually try and make some things and double check if our theory actually added up. Um, first thing the architects did was make uh, commission a one to 20, I think, scale model, uh, which was really interesting because they actually managed to make all of the uh, panels in basically the same way as we were proposing out of little thin sheets of brass, I think it was, and fold them over and hang them on a cable net. So this all kind of moved a little bit when you blew on it. Uh, I think at one point we were in the architect's office with a hairdryer running around it just to see what was happening, which was really cool. Um, they then also, I think they ended up making two of these, one to have in their office and one to send off to Dubai to sort of sell the clients on the fact that we were going to be hanging um, panels to a structure and it was all going to kind of move in the wind. But I think it was pretty successful in the end. It really does look kind of just like what the final show structures look like. Um, we did a couple of 3D printing um, of both clamps between cables. So that's what's on the left there. There's a little 3D printed clamp to try and work out a simple way of clamping two cables together. And then on the right of uh, washers and clamps. So the, the bottom couple there of uh, clamps are clamping onto the cable. And you put a washer onto that that can rotate around. And the washer has clips on it that clip it onto the panel. It all kind of seems complicated and like you're really getting involved in product manufacture at this point. 
Um, but when you're making thousands and thousands of these, it's actually pretty cost effective to just come up with exactly the right shape you want rather than trying to use some uh, bespoke thing. Um, a lot of those are slightly damaged because we also tested what would happen when they were actually installed onto panels and then the panels were shook back and forth and uh, wobbled and also outside. I think they were throwing water and sand on them as well in Dubai just to check what the sort of what would happen when there was sand in the bearing. Uh, we tested a bunch of them kind of to destruction and we also mm -hmm. tested a bunch of them uh, over the course of a week or two just to see what happened when the washers started to wear. Uh, and that started to give us ideas of how long the washers would last and how long the stainless steel part would last. Uh, the washer was a really a critical bit in this because if you just hung the aluminium panel directly onto a stainless steel washer, the washer would just bear straight through the aluminium panel because it was so much softer and it would probably not last very long and get jammed very quickly, ending up kind of half meter by half meter panels that were precariously hung from the cable net. Uh, so as part of our um, design and testing of these, we started to kind of sketch out what the maintenance schedule would be of going and checking that these washers were still intact and in place and what happened if they weren't as well. So um, one of the things we incorporated into the panels was a kind of clamping mechanism so that if the panel washer did break, then the panel still couldn't actually fall down. You would just tell that it was not attached as well as it could be and not free to move. Um, we also did a full-size prototype. Um, you may realize that the cable net and the panels on this are very different to the final design. Um, this is partly because of the program of the project meant that we were still kind of playing around with a couple of different options for cable net at the time that we had to say, right, let's pick one of these and build it and see how that goes and see how easy it is to build. Um, the outcome kind of sort of from this and sort of from our development of the architects was that this isn't a cable net that's very easy to build. It's not a cable net that's very easy to attach panels to. And we scrapped this design and went for the concentric rims, which was the final design. So it was useful to build, but ended up being completely different from the final one. There was quite a bit of discussion about whether it was worth trying to adapt this, but with the accelerated program and a pretty hard completion dates of sort of end of 2019, we really just didn't have time to. So I'm not even sure if this is still in one piece on the site somewhere. I think they've probably taken it down because it's not really sort of served its purpose. Um, the, yeah, the main sort of testing and prototyping we did though was concerned around wind tunnel testing. As I mentioned before, um, we had a pretty unusual situation and we knew that wind loading was gonna be the key design considerations. So it was definitely worth investing in getting some rigorous testing done for the, um, to try and determine both the wind loads and also what actually happens to the panels when the wind gusted and blowed. So we ended up model modeling and testing three different sizes. We did a small scale model to check the effects of the surrounding buildings, the area, the wind loads that the actual individual structures were gonna pick up. This would look at the directionality of the wind, how that affected uh, when the, um, loads to the shade structures and sheltering of the nearby buildings. Uh, we then did a medium state scale cladding model, um, which is really to look at how the cladding pressures varied around the, um, the shade structures and also a little bit of how the perforation and moving panels would kind of interact, interact with each other. So we did a three by three grid. Um, and then, yeah, we did have panel pivoting in that as well, just to kind of check um, what happened when they did actually get um, blown in the wind. But then slightly unusually, especially for a building, we then did a small scale test. We did one-to-one -one tests as well. So you can see on the right there, one of the panels we made to actually check the exact panel that we were doing. So the actual geometry, actual perforation, um, and actual inertia, especially of the panel and how that behaved in the wind. Um, the edge sharpness was also, I think, quite a big effect because on the medium and small scale models, the edges of the panels were kind of comparatively very thick, whereas in reality, there would only be two or three millimeters thick aluminium. So this is the small scale, so it's a one to 100 model of sort of bits of the um, Expo site with various collections of sunshades on them. And the red ones there are the ones that are actually being tested, the rest of their as background. 
I think they did a couple of different sort of locations and collections of um, sunshade stretches. And then the whole thing's on a circle, so you can rotate it around and see what happens in different directions to wind. Uh, this is then the cladding model. So it's a one to five scale. Um, I think they laser cut these out of bits of plywood uh, to make the panels so they're kind of thicker than they would be at scale, but um, are acting in the same sort of situation, have the same clamps, the same sort of size cables. Uh, it was really to start to look at what happens on one chunk of the sage structure. And then here's a full scale panel. So this, I think, is one of the larger ones. I think it's the second largest panel from the tree um, and they put it in and this is much more of a kind of um, aeronautical sort of testing thing where you can see the circle on the side there where they're changing the angular pack of it and checking what the different effects are there. Um, this one actually has all of the perforations sort of covered up which is why they kind of faded there so they compared what the panel was like in its sort of notional solid state and what it was like with the perforations so they could get an idea of exactly the benefit that the perforations were adding. Uh, we also then mounted these on a rig uh, and actually hooked them on to allow them to move and sort of check out that as well, which was a slightly unusual thing, I think, for them to be doing because it was somewhere between a building model and a sort of mechanical and aeronautical sort of model. So mm -hmm. we had to really sit down with them and go, look, here's what we want to get out of it. How are we going to achieve that? Uh, they ended up testing this in the UK in Milton Keynes and also in Canada somewhere as well. So there's different scale models done in different places. Uh, I think the, the medium scale ones were done in Canada because they had a larger wind tunnel, whereas these we could just about fit in the uh, UK one. Uh, so what were the kind of results of this quite in-depth wind tunnel testing? So the overall pressure coefficients because of all the buildings around the structures whereas we've got a 40% reduction on if you just have one chase structure in the middle of nowhere, which was good, but kind of expected and kind of being basically aligned with what we're expecting from the test study. Um, we think the perforations uh, reduced by about 15%, which was pretty good. So that's slightly less than the actual solidity of them because of the kind of size of the perforations and the edge effects. Uh, and then the swinging of the panel reduced by another 35%. Um, which was pretty good in the end. Um, that was a pretty conservative estimate. The smaller panels were had much lower inertia and moved out of the way much more easily. So those ones actually shed a lot more. I think they were shedding more like 50% um, of it. So I think one of the kind of lessons we learned from this, but it was a little bit late to fully enact, was that the smaller panels meant you got a lot less wind load. So potentially having more smaller panels would have been better for the wind load. But obviously, then you've got a lot more elements and components to put together. So that's a total of about 67% from a kind of solid flat shape that were on its own in the environment, um, which was pretty good. And that sort of directly relates back to how big the mast needed to be, how big the foundations needed to be, how tight all the cable neck needs to be taught. Uh, so you really are going to see a lot of material savings from that. Uh, we also verified that the theoretical swinging frequencies of all the panels did match up pretty well actually to what the actual one-to-one -one panels were swinging at when we were testing them. So that was all kind of very useful stuff. Uh, so they then started building them, which was pretty amazing to suddenly see these sort of small computer models that we've been looking at and scale models built to 17 meters high and 17 meters wide diameter um, shaving structures going down all the main streets in Dubai. And you can see in the background now, they're still kind of constructing the buildings while they're putting up the basic cabinets of these. All of the cable, the actual shade structures went up incredibly quickly because we would managed to um, simplify the tensioning procedure so that they just needed to tension at the top and then essentially locked off one lock nut and the entire thing was locked into place. And you can see the, the kind of shadow that we're creating on the ground there looks pretty similar to our render. So that was pretty satisfying. Um, here's some kind of photos of that clamping mechanism and the washer. I think this is a sort of prototype washer that then got swapped out for a proper one of clips to keep it in place. And you can also see uh, on the photo on the right there, the kind of extra lever bit that we'd CNC'd into the panel that would be bent into the closed position and stop the panel from ever coming out of its kind of book mechanism there. Um, so yeah, I think here it hopefully works is 
video of them all sort of gently spraying in the breeze, which is also very satisfying to have it look a little bit like what we'd been generating in the original um, images. So that was also pretty cool. Um, one of the things that Zoe that came out of one of the first couple of sunshade structures that got made and had all the panels put on, and it was actually this one that we're inspecting, was that um, all of the panels actually ended up syncing up with the frequency of the actual mast. So this is a video of them trying to excite this phenomena. This is a very nice early guy from Australia yanking on one of the shade structures, trying to get them all vibrating in time with each other. And you can kind of see that rather than it being the kind of randomized, um, randomized movements of panels that you were seeing in that first video where everything was sort of fluttering in the wind, once the wind really got going and hit a certain speed, actually a bunch of the top panels would start syncing up and then that would end up exciting the entire structure and everything would sync up together, which was not an ideal situation because it would basically lead to um, an ever increasing amplitude of that vibration until damping took over or the wind died down. So I think this got observed once at a particularly high wind speed day, which is why we then got called over to site to have a look at it and really investigate it. So to try and understand this, we kind of went back to basics again. We working out um, even more accurately the exact swinging frequency of all the panels uh, and exactly what affected them. It turned out that there wasn't really much damping in the swing of the panels, but there was a bit more in the shade structure, which meant that the two frequencies that we thought were sufficiently far away from each other, so the swinging frequency of the panel and the natural frequency of the mast actually ended up slightly closer than we thought to each other, which led to this problem. So what was the kind of solution to this? So the, the problem when we started doing a lot of analysis of it, it was that the swing frequency of the top panel was within 5% of the mass frequency. And then the next two rows actually was also, oh, that's not, uh, the, swing frequency of the next two rows was then within 5% of the top two rows of panels. So we ended up mobilizing all three of the top three rows of panels along with the mast and ended up with this kind of chaotic system. It's, it's actually a kind of double pendulum system as well. So you end up with a, an actually chaotic system that's very difficult to predict and especially very difficult to work out what the actual amplification of load you're gonna end up with on that is due to the positive feedback loop. Um, so yeah, all three then synced up. Um, if the top row of panels wasn't actually there, which we did test on one of the J structures, then it didn't seem to sync up as much as easily because the next ones down were further away from the mass frequency. Um, fortunately though, the shade structures predominantly weren't just on their own um, vibrating like a tuning fork. They're all attached together with webbing. So as soon as we'd attached the webbing between the first two shade structures, that damped and added extra mass to the vibration of the overall structure, enough that the frequency of that was then separate or distant enough from the swing frequency of the panels. And so we didn't actually, couldn't actually mobilize this um, behavior again. Um, of course, there was one lone shade structure that didn't actually have anything attached to it. And so in that one, what we did was added extra weights to the panel in order to change the panels to the swing frequency. So we left the mast as it was and dealt with the swing frequency, the swing frequency of the panel. Um, we did quite a few tests of this as well. So this is kind of using some of those panels that they had still retained, fortunately, from the, um, from the wind tunnel testing and attaching weights to the top and bottom of them and then swinging them, and moving the weights around and double checking that that did change the frequency how we wanted to. So from a kind of slight panic at start where we observed this behavior in a single shade structure tree, uh, we managed to justify with a bunch of additional analysis and testing that actually it wasn't a widespread issue at all and would end up just being a problem with one, uh, one actual shade structure. Um, yeah, it was a quite an unusual thing to suddenly, suddenly realize that we'd thought a lot about how the, how the actual how everything moved and what the dynamics of it was, but really we didn't have one thing that had a vibration mode. We had one thing 
that had a vibration mode with then a bunch of other things with their own swing frequencies attached to that, which ended up being a much more complicated system than the sum of its parts. So that was kind of uh, useful, but then everything else went reasonably smooth after that. So here's kind of some of the finished shade structures in the finished districts as well. You can kind of really get an idea of the scale as well with the guy walking past it there. I like said the all of the shading actually worked exactly as we wanted it to. And when we were there just walking around, you could really tell the difference between walking in the shade of the shade structures and walking not within that shade. I mean, from this photo, it looks like, you know, there's still a lot of sun there, but the actual air temperature where it was shaded was so much lower where it was. And it was pretty satisfying to go, yeah, this is definitely needed to make the space outside actually usable. So what did we learn from, from this? What would we actually um, take away from this to try and apply to slightly less or slightly more standard buildings and constructions? Um, I think having a clear initial concept and remembering it through the design process was one of my main takeaways. The original concept of saying, right, we want to make the panels pivot in order to make the lightest structure that we possibly can was really the kind of the, the guiding star of this project and it meant that everything else kind of followed on from there. So anything that made it more complicated, anything that stopped the panels from pivoting as freely as they possibly could was avoided and tried to design out and sort of simplify it and keep that concept easy. So for example, the washers, we wanted to make sure there was only one type of washer and it was really robust and that every panel could have that same washer attached to it so that we didn't have to design multiple different things and we knew that everything would be free um, pivoting. We spent quite a lot of time and prototyping, developing that washer to make sure it did the job we wanted it to. Um, time spent exploring all the options early is always well spent. I think we did, even though we had quite a tight program on this, we really focused at the start and had a lot of workshops with the architects to run through all the different situations, all the different things, the different options that were possible. We spent a lot of time looking at different cable nets and different fixings and different connections and talking through their um, benefits. Um, we went through quite a few different like ways of hanging the uh, panels and letting them pivot as well. I think at one point we were talking about having sort of horizontally hung panels that would spin round and round, um, which had a lot of its own um, issues. And I'm kind of glad we didn't go down that route. But um, I think we really didn't kind of firm up anything until after the first couple of stages, other than that clear initial concept. Um, using parametrics to help your design not lead it, I think there's also quite a good learning thing on here. You can spend a lot of time making up really perfect um, parametrics, models and processes, whereas at the end of, end of the day, the point of doing them is to kind of help you out rather than not just sink all your time into it. Um, there was a couple of points where we sort of caught ourselves going, look, do we need to actually model this to that level of accuracy in order to understand this issue? And the answer was normally no, and therefore we can simplify those processes a little bit. Um, making time for testing as well. Um, again, because of the slightly condensed um, project program on this as well, we managed to do a lot of testing, but there was some testing that was happening while we were actually building the structures and while we were needing to finalize the shapes of all the washers. So I think the washers ended up being delivered to site later because we insisted that they needed to be thoroughly tested before we actually put them up, because otherwise they'd be replacing them all again in like um, a very short amount of time. I think the very first shade structure they made they actually used washers that then started breaking because we'd already kind of moved on in, on in the design. So they had to then change, swap those over before the actual expo at the end of the project, they sort of looped back to it. But it would be nice to be able to have made time for that more um, starting through as well. And the, I guess the prototype as well, the, the, um, the first shade stretch we did using a completely different cable net, it would have been nice to be able to redo that for the program just didn't allow it. Uh, don't afraid to change something, it's not working. Um, yeah, the washers again are a good example of that. I think the, the cable net as well, that we kind of had almost settled on the spiraling cable nets, but then knowing how difficult that was for them to build and knowing and tension effectively meant that we kind of steered away from that into a kind of sharp turn to go, right, no, let's simplify the actual cable net in order to simplify the way that the panels are fixed and the way that they can pivot 
So that's again, going back to that clear initial concept of going, does this cable net shape actually help us pivot the panels? If the answer is no, then probably worth changing. And um, keeping simple, yeah, always a good thing to bear in mind. Um, simple normally means easy to build and low cost. And I think the simple ideas in this were the things that, um, that were really the most effective. So yeah, then these are some um, photos of it, of the, the finished shading structures. So yeah, with all the actual streets and kind of additional things around them, they suddenly look really in place. And the sort of scale of them as well, it's difficult to pick up on some of the aerial views of this because they're scattered throughout all of the main streets, but actually kind of take over all of the buildings on those main streets and make them usable, which is really cool. Here's some photos of it uh, looking up. And then uh, light night views as well of them are always really cool because they're the lighting of them. They spent quite a lot of time once the aid actually decided how we were going to construct them and what they're actually look like. The lighting guys had a lot of fun coming up with different ways to light them in the different areas. Yeah, that's my presentation. Hopefully that was useful and not too technical, but yeah, it was a really interesting project. So thanks everyone. Great, thank you very much, Alex. That's a fascinating, superb talk and um, some really intricate engineering uh, that goes into making something like this feasible and deliverable. Um, if there are any questions from participants, please put them in the question answer uh, box, uh, and we can uh, we can have a discussion now. Whilst you're whilst you're thinking and, and typing, I'll, I'll sort of kick off. Um, I had a couple of thoughts um, whilst you were talking, Alex, about gust response. And um, when we work on on longer span bridges, we're really aware that um, wind pressure varies quite a lot over the length of a bridge, especially when you're looking at um, long span structures. Um, and that uh, variation in, in gust uh, pressure can lead to a dynamic um, response uh, if, you, if, if gusts correlate or, or you get shedding uh, in, in, very, in the various ways and various modes of shedding that you get. Did you look at that dynamic wind interface with your dynamic effect, uh, the dynamic behavior of your structure? Um, we did look at it in a reasonable amount of detail. It's not quite not quite at the scale where we'd have to fully look at it as the overall structure, but we definitely looked at sort of when the shading structures are tied together, what happens if one of them is in a essentially a tunnel of gust, um, whereas the other ones aren't, and so it ends up pulling on each other or pushing onto each other. Uh, we did quite a lot of work on the mast as well, where that's really where vortex shedding could happen. And that was another thing actually I didn't mention that came out of the wind tunnel testing, whereas we were quite worried about that before the wind tunnel testing and then working with them and then making their models. They essentially came up, came off the back of that and said, look, you're, you're never going to get vortex shedding on the mass because it's surrounded by panels. It's going to be such like um, you're never actually going to get a laminar flow onto there. And yeah. so you just don't need to worry about that at all. And so we're like, great, good. We can tick that one up on this. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah I, I had the same thoughts. Laminar flow is very, very unlikely, but you might get buffeting and uh, the usual um, interaction dynamic forces that you get with, with wind loading. Um, uh, and my, my second question was um, a, a more prosaic one, I suppose, about climbability. And I, I think in the UK, anyone running a, a shopping centre like this would immediately go, that looks like a ladder. How do we stop people climbing it up, climbing up it? Was, was that raised? Um, and was it, is it an issue in this environment? And, and how would you deal with it? Yeah, it, it was raised. And I mean, you can kind of just see on this image here that the dots are the lights that are on the connecting nodes where you've got a um, horizontal ring of cables and a vertical ring of cables. And there's none below about three meters, I think. So actually the, the bottom section of the cable net is just vertical cables. I think in the early mock-ups, we had the, the cable nets and spirals going all the way to, to the base. Um, whereas then, yeah, the architect rightly pointed out that you just created a, a very nice ladder there that someone will definitely climb. Yeah. Uh, it's, unfortunately, people point these things out often, often too late in the design process. So glad to see it was solvable. Um, are there any more questions from our online audience? I haven't got any coming through. Um, I suppose my, my final question, and uh, based on um, 
what is a very lightweight structure, I suppose. Um, did you do any work on on the embodied carbon that goes into this? The the, the, the you know defining an area that it shades is uh, is is fairly accurate, but um, probably a bit nebulous. Um, but I'm aware that aluminium has a very high embodied carbon content. How 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 do you feel it stacks up from a sustainability point of view? Yeah, we did. We have looked into this in a reasonable amount of detail. If you take the area that it shades and use that as your floor area, then it does very well. Of course, that's not really a particularly fair way of doing it for a kind of more infrastructural installation project like this. Um, and yeah, the aluminium, I think, is about 60% of like the overall. It's much more than all the rest of the steel. Um, I think the one of the things, I guess, is to, to sort of think about what we managed to save on it. And by making the panels pivotable and doing that in-depth wind tunnel testing meant that we actually did save quite a lot. I think the initial mock-up we did which was that prototype one, the mast on that is about twice as much steel as the final shade structure, because that was before we'd completed actually doing all the wind tunnel testing and we didn't want our first in place mock-up to uh, not be standing by the time we built the proper ones. Um, so we went, we were conservative on that and just went straight to sort of like standard approaches. Um, and all the panels on that are also fixed as well. So that kind of shows the benefit of what we managed to save. Um, Hopefully, yeah, it's not an art installation project, so it's not like these are all going to be um, chucked away immediately. And it is still there now while they're kind of readapting it. So, yeah, it's it is a it, it's a high um, body carbon figure, but um, we think it sort of has its benefits, especially in kind of long term and recyclability of the aluminium as well. And I suppose. Um... If you've made the decision to put a shopping center or a, or an expo center in that zone um these shade structures are significantly better than an air-conditioned uh, roof and, and more so um you know take take the small wins right yeah um, that's true i mean in, in dubai especially there's not that many districts that have outdoor space for exactly that reason they're all just completely internal mm -hmm. centers so yeah you're right so wider social benefits there <laughs> Well, yeah, we go back to the original brief, perhaps. But um, OK, um, thank you very much, Alex. It's been a, a fascinating uh, talk. Thank you for your time. Uh, congratulations again on winning the Nethercott Prize. Um, and we will close the webinar there. Yeah, thanks thank very much for having me.